So, welcome back, everybody. Um, I, I think uh, it, it's it's now accord, according to my watch, which I think is real, is quarter of, and so let's let's start in. Um, our next speaker is going to bring uh, some private sector perspective to this, to the economics of um, management and control of weeds. And it's uh, Mike Cox, who promised me that he would uh, have the talk finished by the time of the last talk finished. <laughs> so, uh, Mike, the microphone's yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and I really appreciate this opportunity to come and talk about something I'm fairly passionate about. Um, one of the things I want to let you know, I, I'm by training a medical microbiologist, and I, when I was working at Stanford in the microbiology lab, we identify anaerobic bacteria by what they eat and what they make. And then this one book we have is this said this organism makes abundant hydrogen, this said make very much hydrogen. and so. I knew about that uh, for a long time, and so at some point I decided to see if I could actually use anaerobic bacteria uh, to convert waste biomass into hydrogen. And I've spent about 40 years on that, and it really turned out that I could actually make hydrogen, but I couldn't make any money. And uh, so what happened, uh, furthermore, is that in this big fermenter, and, and when I was done, I, I'd get, you know, quite a bit of hydrogen, and then I had this whole fermenter full of uh, leftover slop, and I didn't know what to do with that, and it's gonna take sewage treatment or something, and then my farmer friend sent it out for soil analysis and came back and said, I'm paying $5 a gallon for that stuff. So this is better than making gasoline, uh, and it's already refined as, as soon as we're done. So just quickly, you know that photosynthesis in its narrowest definition is hydrogen harvesting. Chlorophyll gets enough energy to pull hydrogen off of water, hooks it onto carbon dioxide and makes sugar. So sugar is a hydrogen uh, storage device. And it's uh, 20 times more efficient than a steel tank on a weight basis. So at any rate, uh, I just wanna make one more comment I'm an anaerobic microbiologist, and uh, Robert Hungate actually did the defining piece of technology that made anaerobic microbiology easy, and he was from uh, UC Davis. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's see, where do I flip it? Oh, here, okay. So there's uh, uh, the textbook, it's rumen and it's microbes, and this was written back in the 60s, but it's still granite information, and, and we still use it every day in, in, in our research. Um, so I think we've already seen a lot of pictures of water heists. I, I love this picture, though. This is a bridge across the river in, in uh, Bangladesh where they have the boats tied end to end to get across the river. That's actually probably disruptive. Um, and then you all know about, we've seen charts of where it lies here, and then uh, uh, these are just, some, uh, again, some examples of clearing water hyacinths, and uh, uh, then the big piles of water hyacinths that has to be disposed of. Um, and you know that the, we've already heard that it, de it depletes oxygen. One acre can be 200 tons. Uh, if it's uh, mechanically uh, harvested, they have to play, find a place to go f with it. And while it's sitting there rotting on the bank, the, all the CO2 in there is being released to the atmosphere. So <clears throat> our vision is to generate hydrogen and fertilizer from water hyacinths. Uh, it would create an economic uh, incentive for mechanical removal, to develop a process that doesn't re re release greenhouse gas and 100% of the water that enters this system will go back to the crop as liquid fertilizer, so it conserves the water. So most of you probably know about anaerobic digesters, and generally an anaerobic digester, you th it, it's hunter, the current ones are what I call hunter-gatherer technology. You throw everything in and you get what get, and, and there's very little science there. So, uh, and generally it takes about 20 to 30 days to do an anaerobic digestion and, and that method. So what happens in that pot, there's three groups of bacteria. Group A convert 
carbohydrates and hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and organic acids. And that process, if it's controlled, is finished in about six hours. Group B converts the hydrogen and carbon dioxide into methane, and group C take the organic acids and make methane. Well, you have to consider that all the hydrogen used in industry is made from methane. So if you convert hydrogen into methane, you've just taken a great finished product and made raw material and spent a month doing that. And all the organic acids, such as uh, acetic acids, made from methane. So if you take acetic acid and make methane, you've just made a finished product in a raw material. And, and all of those have taken a lot of extra time, and you've ended up with a less value uh, end product. So the first thing we do is we sterilize our feedstock, and then we only put in A organisms. And, uh, and that allows us, <coughs> in a matter of six hours, to complete what you would consider a compost cycle. Um, so uh, I just want to show you what happens in nature. Winogradsky was the father of, of environmental microbiology, worked out the nitro, nitrogen cycle and the sulfur cycle in soil. And uh, this is a uh, Winogradsky window that I had a couple of interns set up. And I told them that you're going to set this thing up and you're going to do gas chromatography on it twice a day but you'll never see hydrogen because the B, B groups are there that eat all the hydrogen. So at any rate, uh, this is the next day, and poor Mike is backpedaling. It's a huge hydrogen peak there. Uh, uh, and so there's a little methane peak there. And notice that the water that was on top is down here now. It's made so much gas, it's actually floating that grass. This is lawn trimmings that are in there. and. Um, but I want you to watch this hydrogen peak as we go to the next day. So the B guy has got it. So we, we no longer have hydrogen and you won't ever see it again. Um, and so you'll notice that the uh, water's going further down because the, the gas is floating the mud and the methane's picking up. And, uh, and then you start seeing a uh, purple sulfur bacteria now this is a, a photosynthetic microorganism that's anoxygenic. It gets its hydrogen off of hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide is a, a, a requirement in its diet. And hydrogen sulfide is lethal to us. Oxygen is lethal to this organism. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you can see that that grass is slowly being digested and see by day 43 that grass has been turned into methane. Well, if we would have had that grass in our fermenter with some agitation and with a single organism, in six hours that would have been hydrogen, and we wouldn't have to wait 43 days to get the end product. So what we do is we have a substrate, bell peppers, water hyacinths, grass clippings, whatever it is, and we grind it up, and then we, we have these uh, test tubes. Let's see if I, I forgot. And this is another neat thing. This has a stopper on top. It's called a Hungate stopper after Dr. Hungate. Um, so uh, what we do is we make up the substrate in test tubes like this, and then we inoculate it with a, a, a whole variety of different bacteria, and then we have a pressure transducer we stick in the top, and the one that makes the pressure, most pressure gets the job. So it's just a very simple way that we can screen uh, organisms for how well they're going to make hydrogen for us. Um, and so then uh, uh, we find the optimum organism and the optimum temperature, uh, pH, uh, nutrients. And then here's the water hyacinths we picked up, up on, the, at, uh, on, on the delta. We ground it and it turned into kind of a soup. We then uh, tried four of our top organisms. These two didn't get a job. These two are finalists. Then when we added a couple of supplements, organism 121 ended up being the one that we put in the fermenter and uh, converted that water hyacinth into hydrogen and, and uh, fertilizer. So here we have a disintegrator. And you can see once we put the water hyacinth through that disintegrator, it's a pumpable soup. And that makes it a lot easier to handle. So it seems if you're harvesting, the first thing you want to do is grind it, and then you 
you could tank it and pump it because we have to have it ground. Then we pump it into the, fer uh, the fermenter and then uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we control which organism we put in, the temperature, the pH, pressure, osmotic consideration, sugar content. And um, one of the things you can see, this is a batch, and we inoculated here, and you can see at about 10 hours it really took off. And, um, and if you look over here, you can see we were talking about those exponential up curves and down curves. Well, there it went up, and there it went down. So just about all the work that was done was done in about a four hour uh, period of time. And you can also see as the pH dropped, is also when the activity drop. So uh, what we're able to do then is, what, we're, what we've just finished is a continuous situation where we get up to this peak and then stay there on, on a continuous basis so we can run for months and be running at, here at the moment, we're making about nine moles of hydrogen per hour out of a 200 liter fermenter. So the, uh, uh, we're making about half hydrogen, half CO2, and this nitrogen and oxygen are probably, you know, um, you know collection needle contaminations. And there's a whole bunch of organic acids, and all of these organic acids are primary nutrients for plants. Um, and uh, the CO2 that's coming off, we actually bubble through potassium carbonate, I mean potassium hydroxide, <laughs> We bubble it through potassium hydroxide and make potassium carbonate, which is the ultimate ideal potassium fertilizer. You know, most potassium fertilizers, potassium chloride, and the, the chloride is not good for the farm. And uh, I didn't know this until recently, but most of the CO2 a plant gets is, comes from the soil. Uh, it, it turns out it would take 10 cubic acres of air to, to provide the CO2 for one acre of crop. So most of the CO2 that a plant utilizes actually comes out of the soil. And someone was talking a little bit earlier today about how they're able to convert carbonate into carbon dioxide. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what we end up with is hydrogen for fuel cells. And one acre of water hyacinths will fill that truck. Now, uh, the, the sad thing about that story is that 44,000 pound trailer will haul 860 pounds of hydrogen. Um, and then we get this liquid fertilizer, and again, this sells for about $5 a gallon. And then we end up with about 25% of the volume as a solid uh, enriched uh, soil amendment. Um, so each ton of water hyacinths will produce two kilograms of hydrogen and about a thousand kilograms of liquid fertilizer. Uh, you can sell carbon credits, $50 a ton at the moment. And the, uh, the state of California will give you $1.26 for every uh, kilogram of, of renewable hydrogen you produce. It'll uh, obviously clear the waterways for commerce uh, and uh, permit uh, recreation activities. Um, uh, Rindodonax would be another good c candidate uh, because it grows fast and it's ab abundantly available. Um, it uses a lot of water. So again, and, and what we're doing is, is we're taking invasive species, ag waste. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention is, is there's fear that if you can make money on water hyacinths that people would try to make more water hyacinths. But, but in reality, we want to have water hyacinths depletion problems. And then we'll go to wheat, uh, rice straw, and other ag waste as our input material because all those things will work. So, so let's use this as a uh, stimulus to get such systems set up and run out of water hyacinths and then, then move to rice straw, which is also a big problem um, and for the rice farmers. You know, they used to let them burn it, but they can't do that anymore. And if they leave it there, it causes disease. And if they take it away, it costs money. So this would be a way to make money on, <coughs> make money on that problem. So we take the, these materials into the plant 
for a minute, we end up with hydrogen, CO2 plus potassium hydroxide. We have the potassium carbonate fertilizer. We end up with a liquid fertilizer and a sol solid uh, amendment. In terms of uh, uh, where, where to use hydrogen, well, uh, <coughs> Nuvera is making fuel cells to power forklifts, and um, Plug Power is also doing the same thing. And uh, two weeks ago, I actually drove a Toyota Mirai, and I just ordered one, so it, I'll get my hydrogen fuel car in uh, February. Um, and they're building, and you know, the first, I mean, one of the first hydrogen gas stations just opened in Sacramento. So this is the coming uh, fuel. Um, and if we can make hydrogen from these waste materials, there will be no fuel that will be able to compete with hydrogen as a, as a fuel. At the moment, it's about you know, 11 to $14 a kilogram, um, which is, uh, well, when you consider it's three times more efficient than gasoline, that, that's putting in about $4 a gallon for gasoline. So that, oh, oh, and I forgot to tell you, you need to go and look at uh, Google, the Toyota Mirai is full of crap. <laughs> so, uh, and Mirai is M-I-R-A-I, or just look for the Toyota fuel cell car. But at any rate, <laughs> they, they're, running, um, they're running this Toyota Mirai on cow manure. And, but it's, it, and the engineer that did that video is the vice president of Nuvera, who's making those fuel cell driven forklifts. Um, that's his company right there. And the last thing I want to mention is something that I think is fascinating, but the birth of industrial fermentation started with an anaerobe. And um, an anaerobic bacteria is also responsible for the birth of the nation Israel. Um, and in the First World War, the British needed a lot of acetone to make gunpowder, and they, uh, they were buying their acetone from Germany, uh, which wasn't working. <laughs> uh, so they put a circular out. Does anyone know how to make acetone? And there was a chemist up at Manchester University who was trying to make uh, artificial rubber, and he needed butyl alcohol, which you know is a four-carbon alcohol. And uh, so he had this bacterium, which is uh, Clostridium acetobutylicum. If you feed it sugar, it makes two parts of butanol, one part of acetone, half part of ethanol. So he sent that information up, and he, he soon got a summons to come to London and had a meeting with a young Winston Churchill, who is Lord of the British Admiralty in the First World War. And Winston Churchill said, Dr. Weissman, I need 30,000 tons of acetone. How soon can you make it? And he said, well, I've made a few hundred cc so far in my lab. Uh, but if you could get me one of those big distilleries, I can make tons. And Churchill said, well, it's going to have to be gin plants because I'm not going to interrupt the supply of whiskey. So, so, this is true. So they took over six gin plants in England, set up a plant in Toronto, one in Terre Haute, one in Peoria, and they made all the acetone. Um, they needed to make the gunpowder to win the war. So at the end of the war, they offered him any title in the British nobility he chose, and he said, I don't want a title. Uh, I want a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine. So they did the Balfour Declaration, which set aside Israel, and he went on to be the first president of Israel. So that was the beginning of this whole biotechnology revolution. So, uh, um, thank you. Yeah. So I also want to acknowledge uh, Katie Easton, Susie Parrish, and uh, Matt Avrell, who are the scientists that have been working on this project with me. So one ton of hyacinth, is that wet or dry? Wet. Wow. OK. Uh, it, the problem with hyacinth, though, is it's so much water. How are we going to transport it to this plant? That, that just seems really difficult, getting it out of the water into the plant. Yeah. Once it's to the plant, that it yeah. sounds great. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it but it, you know, at $1,000 a ton, you can probably find a way to haul it. <laughs> um. 
it also, if you want to see a little, if you Google pepper hydrogen, you'll see a little YouTube video of, uh, in our lab of actually making some hydrogen out of, uh, out of green bell peppers. More questions? Thank you. So next we have more wisdom from Florida. Um, Mike Netherland, um, who's from the U U.S. Army um, Engineer Research and Re Development Center, will talk about herbicides and aquatic plant management. So, all right. Mike. Well, yeah, I wanted to thank John Madsen for asking me to travel across country and talk about a non-controversial topic. So, um, you know, there's, when they asked me to talk about aquatic herbicides, there's a lot of directions you could go, and you know, I've chosen what I would consider a pretty pragmatic path in that I'm going to talk about what I think your current use patterns are for the Delta and what I think your future use patterns in terms of herbicide use will be, and then Lars can disagree with me. So. <laughs> Let's see. So first of all, what's a use pattern? And a use pattern is a, is a strategy or combination of strategies for target plant control. So it could be a new product, it could be a new plant, change in use rate or formulation, change in timing, phenology. All of these things are, are what go into developing a use pattern. So when you think about managing hyacinth on the delta, there's a, there's a use pattern for 2,4-D. There's a rate that we use, there's a timing that we use for that particular plant. So when we talk about use pattern development, that's what I'm talking about. So I wanted everyone to be on the same page with that. How do we do it in, in aquatics? You can't just go out willy-nilly and spray, and, and Jeff, I think, did a pretty good job of summing that up. Most of the time, we start small scale, scale up, to, then we do scale up to the field. And the field really, in my opinion, is what teaches us to ask better questions. Is we don't just go to the field and say, yeah, this small scale study was successful and, and we know everything. We, we take the small scale, go to the field, then we ask better questions, go back to the small scale, and, and I think it becomes somewhat of a feedback loop and, and hopefully at, at some point produce operation, operational guidance that is useful to the, to the, in, to the managers. So again, we, we do study these things across a pretty broad scale. You know, I know one of the criticisms that we get sometimes from doing mesocosm studies is it's not the field, it's not field plants. But if you can see me holding up my two prize milfoil specimens there, you, you can mimic pretty well in mesocosms what you see in the field in terms of size of the plants and, and somewhat their phenology. So I think we've had really good success at doing a lot of this small scale work and then being able to go out to the field and demonstrate that you know, these types of use patterns actually work. And, and uh, so, 14, you know, Jeff said 15 herbicides. I say 14 because I don't count peroxides as a herbicide. I, I don't know why. Um, but in, in terms of the use patterns, you know, Jeff talked about we had herbicides, six herbicides available in 1986. And then we went for about, uh, you know, 14 years without any new herbicides. We did get triclopyr and amazapyr in 2002 and 2003. And then we just saw a real abundance of herbicides come on. And, and the reason for that is really we developed resistance to the herbicide fluoridone with hydrilla. And it really created a kind of a crisis situation in Florida. And we needed new molecules. So EPA was pretty accommodating in getting us a lot of these new molecules. One thing I'll say about those molecules is everything in blue is, a, is considered an enzyme-specific inhibitor. So they do target plant-specific enzymes. And I think one of the reasons we were able to get those through the registration process faster is that when you look at non-target toxicity of a lot of these um, enzyme-specific inhibitors, we don't have a lot of the issues that we had with something like copper, where you have a lot of non-target toxicity. So we, you know, I'll be interested to hear the next talk because, um, you know, a lot of these compounds have very low toxicity in, in, in my mind from what I've seen from the EPA data. So it'll be interesting to see what, what they're finding here. Um, so an example of use pattern development, it would be we have poor historical control of Kabamba. 
We used products like Diquat, Endothol, Fluoridone for Cabamba. All had real weaknesses. Cabamba was really kind of out of control in a lot of areas in the Northeast US. Flumioxazin got registered, and it was like a, almost like a silver bullet for Cabamba. And now we don't hear about Cabamba problems. You know, I talked to all the managers in the Northeast, and they say, well, we got a product now. That's the way it's supposed to work. We develop a new compound, and gee, it takes care of this problem weed that we've had for years. So, so in this case, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a neat way to, uh, you know, for a use pattern to, to pan out. The other way is sometimes we just stumble into things by dumb luck, and one of the things we learned with the uh, flumioxazin with, with uh, uh, floating plant control was we were seeing we were spraying areas, but we were getting control well outside of the zone that we sprayed, and it, you know, it kind of dawned on somebody, maybe this stuff's pretty active in the water column. And it turned out it was very active in the water column on water, water lettuce. And so what that allowed us to do is to go into a lot of these areas where they used to have to do surface sprays, and anyone who sprayed, anyone in here who sprayed, you know, acres of, of floating plants, that's a lot of time on the water. Um, you can go through with a submersed treatment in just a few hours and be done and be off the water. And what we found with flumioxazin was we could go right through that water lettuce, take out the water lettuce, you'd leave the bulrush, uh, leave a lot of the other native species. So from an efficiency standpoint, we had a new tool, you know, both from an application standpoint and from a, a, a new, new product standpoint. So again, that's kind of a neat way to view things is because we were talking about a 50-year-old use pattern with Diquat, and now we have a tool that, that can really allow us to do some things that we could never do with Diquat because Diquat does not have activity in the water, at least on that plant. So, so I'm going to flip gears here and now talk about the delta and, and controlling agaria in the delta. And what I would basically say is your present is likely your future, is that all of these new compounds we have, we've looked at them and Done, done quite a bit of work actually, you know, across the board on species. And I would say that at least with the new herbicides, I don't see a good technical fit. So talk over, right? You know, <laughs> I came all this way to tell you there, there's really no new tools. Um, you know, that lack of activity in the small scale trials would really be kind of, you know, to me, that's kind of the, the thing that says don't go forward. And we've used that in the past, and I think we need to continue to use that. Um, from what I understand, with diquat, you're limited to 50 acres, and that can only be done after August the 1st. If, if that's the case, you know, it, it makes diquat a pretty limited tool for you guys. Um, I will say this, Egeria is sensitive to diquat, and, and we've seen it in a lot of other systems, clear water systems in the Northeast and clear water systems in the Pacific Northwest. Diquat can be a very good tool for Egeria, but I think the turbidity in the delta is always going to be that limiting factor. I just think it's just it's too turbid, and, and you're probably always going to suffer from high variation uh, with something like diquat. The other thing that's really curious to me about diquat is the agency reviews. Typically, you know, every state kind of does their own review, even the other countries do their own review of, of, of molecules, and they tend to be in general agreement. And I would say diquat is one of the few molecules I've seen where states really have what I would consider some real fundamental differences regarding what you would consider the safety of diquat. California, New York probably falling on the side of being pretty, pretty cautious about putting diquat in the water. Uh, Canada, who I've worked with the Canadians for the last couple of years now, it's the only herbicide registered in the country. And they don't plan on registering any others. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I, I do think that's a little odd, at least with that molecule, that, you know, that, 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 that the reviews are di disparate. Uh, copper use. Copper, I think, would be a great compound for agaria. Uh, I know Lars has been through this, so I won't belabor it, but it's pretty unlikely we're going to be using much copper in the delta. And I would say Florida has a pretty similar policy in that we do not use copper in state water unless it would be, I guess, Jeff, an emergency use, or you could, but it's pretty, pretty tough. Okay. So that leaves us with the molecule that you're using right now, which is fluoridone. And, and fluoridone use patterns in the delta uh, weekly applications, of, and they're called them sonar pellets, so it's the granular formulation for approximately 12 weeks. And what you're trying to do with that strategy is maintain about a part and a half to three parts per billion in the water column. And there's two reasons for that. One is you're balancing uh, pretty significant irrigation concern and restriction. So you've got to keep that, that fluoridone on the low end. You also have to keep it high enough to kill agaria. So you're, you're trying to hit a sweet spot with a molecule in a high dynamic system 
So I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I can't think of a more complex place to try to use fluoridone, and yet it's, I think it's the only tool you're gonna have available to you. Um, you know, for larger scale agaria use for the, for the near future. Now there could be something else come along and, and change that, but, but that's kind of how I would view things. Right now the permit allows up to 6,000 acres, and that can be applied from March 1 to November 15. Uh, to give you a, a, a sense of, you know, some of the recent history, yearly applications from about 1,000 to 3,300 acres, that represents about 1.6 to 5.4 percent of the delta on a yearly basis. So, you know, so they are big treatments. They would be, you know, in, in my mind, fairly on the high end of the cost spectrum. But, you know, again, if it's the only tool that you have, you got to, you know, and, and you're going to use it, you got to make it work. And I think, you know, through a lot of the, the work that's been done with boating and waterways and Lars and, and the company, I think that they've honed in on basically how the product works and how it can work in the Delta. So I, you know, um, I think in a, in a sense, they're, they're, they're probably on pretty solid ground there. So why, why fluoridone for the current and future? And again, I think to meet the stringent requirements in California, you know, and that includes Salmonid data, you know, all of the various issues here, that's a pretty high bar for most companies to go into a system and say, I'm going to spend all that money for a market that's like about 1,000 to 3,000 acres. It's just, I just don't see it um, happening. Um, I think, again, you know, just to reiterate, I think that they're doing a, a fairly good job or as good a job as you can of managing con concentrations in a, in a complex hydrodynamic system. Uh, resistance development, I think that's a big one for people. You know, we've lived through it in Florida. I think that I, I would say unlikely for a couple of reasons. One, the biggest reason is that you get rapid clearance just because of all the flow in the Delta. In Florida, we had a very different situation in that we were maintaining low levels of fluoridone probably for a couple of years and selecting against a population that had tubers that were constantly uh, sprouting into that low level um, concentration of fluoridone. So I, I, I certainly would not say it's impossible I, I learned with, with fluoridone and hydrilla, anything's possible. But I would just say that just because of the system, uh, I think that there's, there's probably less likely chance that you would develop uh, resistance. And no strong technical competitive products. So if there was something out there like a flumioxazin that worked really well on agaria and it was fast acting and it could handle that flow, I think you'd move fluoridone out of the system. In, in a sense, because it, it, you, you're really trying to use fluoridone in a, in a system where it, it, I would say it's probably not the best fit. Uh, other invasive species on the delta, certainly milfoil and curly leaf, we've used fluoridone on those for years. Uh, they're very susceptible, so I think it, at least in terms of the other invasive species that have been talked about, I feel like you know, this is a situation where you know, fluoridone would work on those as well. Um, so a recommendation, I came here, you know, I, I figured, I felt compelled to make a recommendation. I think the biggest thing to me is that, you know, you need a sustained monitoring effort to see what you're accomplishing with your management. And I think without that, it, it, it's, it, it really makes it difficult to justify the expenditure. That if you're going to spend a million dollars on herbicide and you're not really doing a bang up job monitoring it, I, I think you're missing something in, in the big picture. Um, in terms of uh, being, you know, thinking outside of the box, can timing reduce exposure requirements? Are there things that we haven't thought through in terms of how to use fluoridone that, that we should be trying? You know, and I would say, again, I, I, I used to believe that we had thought through almost everything until you start really thinking through some of these problems and realize you, you haven't. Uh, and then I think the last thing, and this is a really important one to me, what's your objective? And what if you go out and control all the agaria and you get something like Illinois pondweed come in just as dense? And, you know, is your objective reduction of, of SAV or is it control of agaria as an invasive? And I think you, you really ought to think through that because the more successful you are with agaria removal, you're going to likely select for something that, that will fill in a lot of that niche. And, you know, it may not be as bad as agaria, it may be easier to control long term, but you know, that, that's kind of my thought process there, is that there's something else out there that you may select for. Um, you know, in terms of monitoring, this was a, this is Kings Bay in Florida, and we got beat up, or I shouldn't say we, the, Jeff got beat up, I'm just the researcher, 
for years about all this uh, lingbia in Kings Bay. So they asked us to go in and monitor this. This is where all the manatees come. And the, the picture you see on your, your left is vegetation in September, and then the picture on the right is March. And you'd say, well, gee, going through the winter, you lose a lot of vegetation. That's a spring-fed system. Spring-fed systems should maintain their vegetation pretty much throughout the year because their temperature is pretty constant. And what it turns out is that there's like 300 manatees in there, and if you do the math, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this is probably a manatee problem. But without the monitoring, it makes it really difficult to go back to the stakeholders and tell them what's really going on. You know, so not just mapping, but doing it by species and showing people what's actually going on. And in this case, um, you know, one of the neat things is we're seeing a marine algae come into the bay and we have all these complaints about lingbia. Lingbia is the worst plant ever and you guys have caused this. And it turns out that the problem that a lot of them are complaining about is a marine algae that's come into the uh, system, which would probably indicate problems with salinity and low flow and a lot of other things that are being, you know, detrimental to Kings Bay. Not the, you know, not the fact that somebody went out and managed four acres of water highest than five years ago. And, you know, and I think so sometimes it's monitoring that can give you answers like that that are really important. You know, another example is we do a lot of point intercept data. This is about a 21,000 acre lake. And, and we'll compare, you know, from year to year. And something like a native plant like uh, knotgrass, which is extremely important to us, when we start seeing that we're going from 53% to 27% frequency, that, that raises an alarm. But, you know, the, the big thing is it's not anecdotal. We have the data. And I think that's important. Um, so switching gears to, to water hyacinth, I would say your future may look a little different, which is probably good news in, in, in some way. So in terms of hyacinth control on the delta, I, I think several of the new herbicides do have a good fit. Um, in Florida, we basically go into large scale adoption of panoxalam for water hyacinth control. And this is on the heels of 50 years of 2,4-D and diquat use. So we had a 50 year established use pattern and started showing some of the managers some of the, the things you could do with something like panoxlam. And I'll, I'll tell you what, the first two years of getting them to kind of buy into the concept was just like pushing a rope because they've been doing the same thing for 50 years, you know. But once they kind of started seeing some of the results, it, you know, it's, it's almost like that once the adoption occurs, it's very rapid. So with, with that product, we use about four ounces per acre. Um, and then, you know, I do want to mention that Amazimox and Bispyroback are also effective, but it's, it's kind of one of those things we didn't want to try to introduce three new products at once. We just picked one and said we're going to try to push this through in terms of showing these guys that there's something beyond the world of 2,4-D and Diquat for, for water hyacinth control. So again, if you think of your current use patterns on the, on the Delta, uh, you're treating 1,500 to 3,000 acres per season is my understanding, reliance on 2,4-D and glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate to me is very surprising in that, you know, we do not use much of it at all in Florida for hyacinth control. We just, we consider it pretty substandard in, in terms of the control. Um, program, and, and there is some operational use of Amazamox in the Delta, uh, that, that, at least from what I understand. Uh, program is supposed to start in April. I think that would always be a good target time. Get started early on that growth curve, uh, and the later you wait, probably the more you're going to spray later on. Um, and, and we've learned this in Florida. If permits are delayed or if contracts aren't let and money's not available, your crews cannot keep up with the growth rate. And we've seen it time and again on Lake Okeechobee is that once we get behind, it, it's just, it's, it's, you don't catch up till the weather cools back down. So in terms of panoxalam and amazomox, they both uh, inhibit the acetolactate synthase enzyme, low non-target toxicity, um, in fact, Amazomox, one of the reasons we brought it into aquatics is that they couldn't find tox endpoints in a lot of the testing that they did uh, with that molecule. So, so again, I'll be interested to hear the next talk and see what they find. Um, label language right now is being modified to support appropriate setbacks for irrigation. That's probably going to be the biggest issue with these products as they stand right now is that they've got to have appropriate label language for irrigation setbacks, and, and I believe the company's working on that. The other kind of added benefit is they're both active on limnobium and Lidwigia. So, um, you know, I think that's kind of a, a nice benefit. But, you know, again, we, we looked at these, and one of the nice things about Panoxlam for us is it allowed us to go right in the middle of bull rush and spray water hyacinth right in the middle of bull rush 
and we could take the hyacinth out of the bulrush. And, and that was such a big deal in Florida because before 2,4-D was just, you know, we, we quit using it because the, it would kill the bulrush and Diquat would brown it up. So it was kind of, you know, one of those, those deals you just hate to do because you knew that the public was not going to be in support of us browning up bulrush. And, and with this tool, we feel like we can really uh, do some different things. So again, what does what does maintenance control look like? And, and you know, I want you to focus on this graph right here. But in 1975, they treated 6,000 acres. In 1985, 12,000 acres. On a lake like Lake Okeechobee, it's so big and the water fluctuates so much. Like Jeff said, when you, you're going to have seeds continually germinating out there, so. I would say on a lake like Okeechobee in 10 years, I would have bet we're going to be controlling about 6,000 acres of water hyacinth. You know, but when you're talking about a 400,000 acre lake and, you know, really being able to go out there and control that, that limited amount of hyacinth, you know, I, I think people have really bought into that program. So the maintenance control paradox to me is we're putting our cost into labor. The, 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 the labor costs of these programs are very high. Uh, the daily spraying efforts give the impression that we're treating a lot of plants and that, that does cause some public pushback. But if you really look at the volumes of herbicide that are being used, they're pretty minimal. And, and I think if we go to something like Panoxlam at four ounces per acre and with all the uh, concern from MPDES about dropping um, overall herbicide usage, those types of products really have a good fit for something like that because we're going from 64 ounces per acre or 32 ounces per acre down to four. And, and getting good control. So final thoughts. Research can help drive major changes in use patterns. And, and this is one where if you look at the treatment date, November of 2013, that's when we do almost all of our large scale hydrilla management now. And that's not the way we used to do it. But it really fits into this. I think John Matson talked about it, you know, when you're talking about the growth curve and when you want to actually treat. You do not want to treat here. <laughs> You know, because if you leave 5% of the hydrilla at that growth rate, it's going to be right back in a few months. And that's been our history, especially with contact herbicides. But one of the things we learn with contact herbicides is if we treat down here, the plant's still plenty metabolically active for the herbicide to work, but you just don't have that growth rate for recovery. So there's all kinds of other factors taking that plant out. And if you can do that, we're getting, you know, basically a year of control, whereas in maybe the past we were getting four months of control. So I think it's very important to think about what the plant is doing and, and maybe just not make assumptions about, you know, growth rates. You, you really need to think about um, what Egeria is doing in the Delta at different times of the year and are there other windows that would be possible for control. Um, this idea of hot spots, and I think somebody, you know, a couple of other talks brought it up. We've gotten to the point in Florida where we manage hot spots and we know where the plants are going to come back and we just manage the heck out of those sites and we just know they're going to come back. It doesn't matter what herbicide you use or what rate or, or they, we know it's going to come back there. But by just picking on those hot spots time and again, what we're finding is it can't be that ecological engineer that allows itself to spread. So there's all kind, there's all other sites on the lake where the plant is just not doing well. Whereas in the past, if we left it alone, it would go throughout and basically dominate the whole lake. Um, so kind of that idea that successful system-wide management may require repeated treatments of the same site, but that's where the plant wants to be, and that's where you need to attack it. And, and I think by doing that, we've got hydrilla in a situation in the state of Florida where I'd say we're as close to maintenance control as we, we're ever going to get. And just to reiterate a couple of things you heard earlier, beware of the new invaders. Hyacinth is a horrible weed, but not that hard of a management problem. Ludwigia is a horrible weed, and it's going to be a, a worse management problem. It's very difficult to control. The, the types of treatments that you have to use for it are going to be inherently non-selective. And I, just, I think it's just going to be something that, you know, at least in Florida, what we've seen is that it's a habitat destroyer. It doesn't just arise organically on its own. It tends to invade other prime habitat and basically just crowd that out. And what's ironic to me is that the same time you guys saw Ludwigia take off in California, we saw Ludwigia take off in Florida. So from that perspective, that gives me a lot of concern. We had Brenda Gruel and John Gaskin down in Lake Okeechobee last week because we're really interested in the, you know, the genetics of what's going, you know, what's, what happened? Because we've had Ludwigia for years and it behaved itself 
and then all of a sudden it's just decided to, to really, on multiple systems at the same time, expand rapidly and, and you know, we're managing it to the best of our ability, but you know, what, per week, what are we spending on harvesting? We're, we're Total, we spent about half a million dollars last year controlling yeah. thousand acres. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's just really taking off. So I think that's just something to be cognizant of that, you know, there, there's always a new one down the road and uh, be aware of that. And I got a few minutes, I guess, wow. I thought I'd talk slower, but when I'm not in the South, I talk fast. So, <laughs> so any questions? How many years before you made a determ determination that uh, somehow had really developed um, resistant to the Floridown? How many years of, that you have used the Floridown before you made well, a decision well, well, that yeah. it has developed that yeah. uh, Floridown resistant? Was Floridown was registered in 1986, mm -hmm. um, at least on the, the chain of lakes where we developed resistance. The first large treatments were not really started until 93 or 94. By 2000, we had basically system-wide resistance. So I, I always tell people that, you know, we had two invasions of hydrilla. We had hydrilla come into the chain, and then if you think about it, we selected for, with, through it was a point mutation, we selected for a resistant strain that basically dominated the chain with, it had to have been within a few years. So, so it, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult when you first select for it because, it, you know, A, it's, it's in the water, so, you know, it's not as easy to visualize. But what happened was we still had a lot of sensitive plants out there, but it was like each year you selected a little bit, you know, selected for a little bit more acreage of resistant plants, and then it got to that level where there was enough resistance acreage that when it went exponential, it took over the system. So, yeah, that was, that was you know, certainly something for you guys to keep in mind is that, you know, it, 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 Agaria is in the Hydrocaryotaceae family. Um, more than likely, that point mutation in that, uh, in that PDS enzyme would confer resistance in Agaria. And, and the other thing that, you know, that was really, it was kind of a cool scientific thing with the Agaria was, or the Hydrilla was, the plant developed multiple levels of resistance. And that's what threw everybody off when we first discovered that was we were saying, well, this strain over here can tolerate, you know, a really high rate. This strain is, in, in, is intermediate, and this strain is, you know, just a little bit more tolerant than the susceptible. But, but it was because there was a different point mutation occurring at that site. And, you know, once the genetics was worked out and everything, people have been able to show that. But it, it really did kind of throw people off when we first discovered that that's what was going on because it wasn't a toggle switch, it was a continuum. And basically, through continued treatments, you will eventually select for the, the most tolerant strain, and, and that basically renders the product where, where it's just not usable based on the label. Maybe one more question. Yeah, Mike, like up at uh, Clear Lake over the years um, in the hydrilla control plots, mm -hmm. You know, they, I think they treat it 20 parts, maybe three or four times a year, mm -hmm. or in a row. Um, you know, it's got to the point where the, you know, it won't phase the milfoil, um, the fluoridone treatments. Mm -hmm. um, it'll knock out the hydrilla, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much hydrilla is in these plots, but because yeah. we'll just go back and follow it up with, you know, with other treatments right. in front of, you know, county sites and stuff like that. What do you think is going on there? Well, it, there's, a, there's a pretty fundamental difference between monoecious and dioecious hydrilla, and, and the, the, the biggest difference that, that we've seen is that monoecious hydrilla, the tubers are, sprout, are cued to sprout in a much more synchronous manner than dioecious tubers. So we do feel like with monoecious hydrilla, if you have the fluoridone there and you're treating on that sprouting event or very close to that sprouting event, you're probably killing most of those plants as they come off the tuber. Um, dioecious hydrilla, at least in a, in a state like Florida, we basically see asynchronous sprouting. So any time of the year, 
that you pull a, pull a, a sample of tubers, you'll have three to five percent of the population sprouting. And, and that makes management really difficult in that dip, no matter when you pick your timing for management, three months later, five months later, 12 months later, there's always a new cohort of tubers trying to come through that. So it, it, it concerns me less about resistance management with Monetius hydrilla because I think the plant undergoes very synchronous sprouting. You're only treating those plants for a fairly concentrated period of time, and you're not treating new, new populations later on in the season. Typically, milfoil, milfoil, you can knock it out at that, and that'll grow right through it. I yeah, mean. milfoil, it, it, because milfoil is it's more perennial, it's coming from a crown, and you're putting low rates of fluoridone, you know, right there at the, at the crown. Um, we've just seen that that's not terribly effective with milfoil. Mil, milfoil is more of a timing issue, trying to get the plant just as it's, just as it's starting to grow. If you let it get any uh, biomass to it and try to treat it, uh, in, in my mind, try to treat it with, with fluoridone pellets in the same manner that you do with something like Monetius hydrilla, you're going to get subpar control. Do you know when the timing that you're speaking of for controlling the Monetius, that sprout window? I, because I, in, in Clear Lake, what we want to do is rotate in an additional chemical such as endothol. Yeah. But I'm having a hard time visualizing replacing a slow release pellet that is out there constantly. I don't want to throw endothol out there when those tubers are not sprouted. I'm just yeah. wasting money at that point. Yeah, I, you know, I think you'd have to do the, the, the sampling and the dynamics for that. But we're, we're doing a, a, a project in the Erie Canal right now and another one is going on in Lake Cayuga in New York, and it's, it's some of the first Monetius data where we've really taken a hard look at when these things are cued to sprout and when they're cued to grow, and it's really all happening within about a three-week period in June. And, and then we don't see it, you know, the, the theory was that we would just continue to see additional sprouting through the summer, and, and we're not. Now, California may be at a latitude where you do, but until you have that information, I think, you know, that what we can say in North Carolina and North is that they tend to sprout in a pretty synchronous manner, much different than the dioecious form. Unfortunately, we don't uh, have enough. We found yeah. seven plants this year in Clear Lake, <laughs> well. um, so we don't have that. Uh, yeah. You don't have that luxury, right? Yeah. Okay, well, understood. Well, thank you very much. Yes. This is going to take us a couple of minutes to um, set up for the next speaker so that if anyone needs to take a quick break, this is a good time to do it. Um, and, but we'll, um, we'll start, start moving again once uh, we're, we're set up in front. Um, Sorry. Also, um, for the panel discussion to follow, uh, the Delta Science Council put together uh, a diagram of a conceptual model as a basis for kind of marking up and thinking about concrete things we can do. And there are a bunch of copies on the table outside stacked up. So if you're interested, grab one of those. I didn't bring my glasses here. Just go to a date modifier. Maybe it would be the first one on the top. No, they won't go put down here. Keep going down. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, the final. Then the last minute. That was the last. What, what, what time was that one? Two. So I'll just press. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, you can use the cursor as an eye. Yeah. 
Okay so. okay, so I know people are, are, will be wandering in, but uh, let's, since we're a little bit behind, let's go ahead anyway. So, um, you know, Tisway and um, colleagues will present on effects of herbicides on um, Yuri Tamora and Delta Smelt. Thank you. All right. So, uh, what we'll talk about today is... Uh, a research project that we got funded by uh, the Palm Boating Waterway, and I want to acknowledge my thanks to them for uh, giving us the opportunity to do this study because uh, we think that this is important for us. Not only, we always talk about, let's go, go out and spray a lot of herbicide out there and try to kill plant, but to answer the question about if they put the herbicide out there, are there any effects on the target organism like Delta Smell or Copper Pot? And I also want to thank U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Liana for help to uh, secure some funding to do a further look into those herbicides that I'm going to talk about and look at whether they have a long-term endocrine disrupting effect where they can affect the delta smell growth or reproduction. So let's give you some overview of what we start doing with the Department Boarding Waterway, which while I keep repeating that, I, I really like this project because it's the first time that I can really and help to answer some question about how our study can help to at least protect some of the uh, target species in the Delta. So we were first charged to, based on the biological opinion by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, so we were contacted by the Department of Boating Waterway to first to look at the effects of the two new herbicides, Panacerum and the uh, Imazumab, and one adjuvant, the surfactant that they use called Agridax, to try to understand whether these chemicals have any effects under laboratory conditions, not under field condition, have any effects on the delta smell embryo and larvae, because we know that those two stages are the most sensitive stages. Then later we asked the question, if we were to study delta smell, and knowing that delta smell could have a uh, maybe full limitation, so we requested from the Department of Boating and Waterway and asked another question, can we also look at the food web, the copper pot, whether the herbicide also affected the food source. So we also uh, do another study to look at the effects of herbicide on copper pot. Then we get greedy. We go back to the Department of Boating Waterway. We say, well, if we were to study new herbicide, what about the old herbicide? Are they better than the new one? Should we test both to tell us that if you spend billions of dollars on this herbicide to kill the plant, are they cost effective? Eventually, you found that this herbicide is curing everything in the Delta. Or, hey, we look at it, we found that the old herbicide indeed are worse than the new herbicide. Using the new herbicide, maybe it's more benefit to the, the Delta to protect the uh, target organism that we want to protect, like Delta smell or native copper pot. So, we propose a study and we, they're approved for funding. So, thank you for that. So. <laughs> Then the third one, uh, we'll do the comparison among those species. Uh, I'm going to talk about that today. And the last one, where we are still in the progress of getting this funding to look at endocrine disrupting effect, and I'm not going to talk about that today. I, I need to talk to the speaker. Yeah, you were going to just on you. That's easier. No, sorry. It's okay. You want to step up? Okay. Thanks. So where am I now? Uh, Okay, so we use standard toxicity study uh, method, 96 hour LC50 method first, to test all those herbicides. So first we acquire the delta smell embryo from uh, the FCCL, the Fish Conservation and Culture Laboratory. And when we get an embryo coming back, we quickly treated them. We have, this, we have to practically get the embryo, have them inseminate the embryo right away, and within one or two days running the experiment. 
Because if we were to wait too long into the embryo development, the chorion that protected the embryo become hardened, it's very hard for us to study the effects of the herbicide on the uh, embryo. So we're trying to work as, hard as, we, as fast as we can to uh, run exposure uh, as fast as we can. Same thing in our lab. I have been culturing the uh, copepot, EOD Mora finis, and we have been culturing this for five years. So we would like to use this juvenile. We, we found, from my previous study with pesticide, we found that the EOD Mora finis is more sensitive than pseudodatomus for, for B side when exposed to organic chemical. Pseudodatomus for B side is more sensitive to metals, but EOD Mora is more sensitive to organic chemical. So we selected EOD Mora finis for this study uh, for the herbicide. Eventually, we most probably move in and look at whether they have any effects on pseudodatomus or not. So, so we'll expose them to juvenile edemora affinis. And like I said, we use one to two days old embryo. And once we uh, hatch the embryo, we also use the two to three day old post-hatch larvae. The reason why we use two to, two two to three days old post-hatch uh, larvae, because we were worried about if, if the larvae hatch at one day, the percentage of larvae dying from the hatching, this natural hatching, will have 15%. So we do not want to include those 15% of natural mortality into our exposure. That's why we wait for two to three days to stabilize the, uh, the survivor before we run the study. And then we'll run 96 hour chemical exposure and renew the clean water. So once we renew it, because after 96 hour, most study will just take down the test and count the survivor but we let them stay for three more days. The reason why we want to do is look at some of the sub-leader effects and see whether after you expose them, put them in clean water, when, when they hatch, what's, what's other effects on the embryo. Try to be as thorough as possible on our, our, our toxicity study. Same thing with the larvae. We will uh, expose them, put them in clean water, wait three more days to see how the effects of the herbicide on the embryo, oh, on the larvae. So for your information, the delta smell takes about 9 to 11 days to hatch. So when we run the 96 hour, we have to wait for another five more days before we can assess the whole uh, hatching success. So in 2014, we won the first acute toxicity study. Uh, we have quite a bit of endpoint. And I maybe choose the wrong, I, I maybe last night when I decided to to present my talk, I may have choose the wrong approach. So what I'm trying to do is do the comparative study. So today I'm not going to talk much about the uh, hatching success, condition factor, or globularity. I want to talk more about the survival between delta smelt and copepot. Do some comparative study uh, to talk about those in today's talk. Here we will look at uh, the herbicide itself and the, comp the mixture of the herbicide with adjuvant, like agadax. It's a factor that they use uh, in combination with the herbicide. To our surprise, the result, which for industry who built this chemical, they would be real happy. It's hardly for us, I mean, it's very hard for us to find the LCPT 50 of the penicillin. And for the Imaz mark, we only see LC50 at the seven days old larvae. Then with the surfactant aqueduct, the uh, LC50 is in seven days, about 44.7 milligram per liter. You may have questioned me why greater than 100 milligram per liter. Why not follow further up to find exactly what is the LC50 of penicillin? Bear in mind that later when, when I explain to you why we did not do it, it's because the concentration used in the environment is per billion. We're talking about per million here. So it's no point for me to provide you with the data of 250 parts per million penicillin that killing delta smell. It's irrelevant in the environment. So once we're done with the delta smell, then we move on and ask, uh, do the study with the copper port using the same experiment design, looking at the uh, same combination of chemical, individual, and mixture. And here we. Uh, have some, mo most of the study with copperport, we got LC50 data. So here you can see in the, uh, 
Oh, I don't have to, yeah. Well, <laughs> here the uh, LC50 of the uh, penicillin is about 63.7. Uh, what I'm trying to say that in the sense that is um, in the data smell study, we don't even get the LC50 even greater than 100 parts per million. But at, at, with the copper port, we can, we can find LC50 indicated that copper port is a little bit more sensitive to the herbicide than the delta smell. But we did not see anything at all with imazumab. This is a good chemical, which I will keep, continue to say that this, I think this is a good chemical. But don't take my word for it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you're recording too, so. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Seriously, I'm done. I know you guys were tired. <laughs> yeah, the bulb burn, I guess. Huh? I, I, this is, I just started, so. <laughs> Yeah, I'm ready for question now. <laughs> I think I, I think I heard the bulb. I think the bulb burned up. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got great data. Too bad. <laughs> well. While I'm waiting for the bulb, I can, I can, I can address something about the foridone. So I don't have the data to show it today, but we do found that, I mean, this is still preliminary data that we, we have just, we just finished this experiment like uh, two months ago. We found that foridone itself may not have direct toxicity to the delta smell, but it has sublethal effect to the delta smell. Once we expose them, let the fish live in the clean water for a few days, we we'll begin to see the deformity of the embryo which indicated some kind of enzyme in the foridon may have affected the development of the delta smell. But at this moment, I did not have the concentration that we think will cause the effect. But we do think that foridon might have some effect on delta smell survival in the delta. Oh, here you go. Thank you. I was wrong. <laughs> so it must mark that we found that the concentration that we're trying to determine to kill the copra pot is pretty, pretty high. It's definitely greater than 100 milligram per liter per, per million. Again, the same thing. We did not pursue further the waste of time in the looking for the LC50. <laughs> The reason also behind why we did not uh, uh, pursue further is because we're trying to dissolve that thick chemical into the water. It becomes more turbid if you go higher than 125 milligram. And the solubility is a problem, the turbidity is the other problem. So if we were to go further into running the study to get the LC50, the data may not be reliable. Oh, I'm running out of time, so sorry. So Agadac, the surfactant, similar to the uh, delta smell study, we found this chemical, this surfactant, or this adjuvant is more toxic to both copepot and delta smell than the herbicide itself. Let me go back real quickly. You can see that Agadac causing at LC50 is 45 uh, milligram per liter for seven days old larvae. So, 
Then we look at the mixture effects. Because we, we do not know. I mean, we, we think that when, when people apply the herbicide, they might have to use a surfactant to make sure that the herbicide stick to the plant, make them more effective killing the plant. So we look at the, uh, the combination of two, uh, one herbicide and one adjuvant, I found that if you mix these two together, the reaction is additive. As you can see, the, uh, on the bottom blue line and the red line, there's a pen penicillin and the uh, acadac. The LC50 is quite high. As you mix those two together, you can see the green line suddenly the bump up there, and the LC50 become 24. It's half of the LC50 that we see in the acadac itself. Similarly, if we were to make imatismox with the agadax, yes, imatismox by itself may have more high LC, uh, 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 LC50, but when we mix it with the uh, agadax, it has reduced it down to about 77, but still very high. Uh, uh, I mean, higher, much, much higher than the one found in the environment uh, that they use. So. So let's, then we put everything together and do the comparison and found that is, if you look at penicillin, the only effect that we see is in the copper part. For the imasmoc, even the copper part itself do not see any mortality at 100 parts per million. So imasmoc, I mean, based on our, our analysis, it's kind of pretty safe for both species. Here is the, uh, uh, I got this data from the Department of Boating Water Wave and uh, this, the application rate they use of water hyacinth and the uh, EGRA denser. And uh, you can see that application, I mean, after the uh, use and then about one meter deep in the water, we're talking about pop per billion. The concentration I showed you earlier is all pop per million, so it's like an order higher than what we see in the environment. So. To conclude my study here, that, like I say, the, the, the concentrations is, is order higher than the, what we found in the environment. Delta smell is more sensitive to imazimal based on the uh, data that we have. But the copper port is more sensitive to penicillin and the agadac. And when you mix both of the herbicide and adjuvant together, you found higher, uh, uh, yeah, a lower LC50, which is more sensitive uh, I, I'm more toxicity to the uh, uh, copper part. And our next study is move on to the uh, uh, look at these effects of all those uh, uh, current use uh, herbicide. And we're still in, in the progress of getting the data. So I don't have any data to present today. I do have data, but I just did not bring it to present it today. So. I'm done. Thank you. We're running a little late, but I think we have time for one question. If uh, open the floor. Thank you. Yeah, have you looked at any of the effects on any of the benthic organisms? In any of these studies? Sorry? Have you looked at any of the benthic organisms or? No, uh, so far the, uh, we're looking at two species. One is the uh, copepod, the other one is the fish. So we haven't looked at any benthic organism that been affected by the herbicide. Uh, the other thing that we want to make, make sure you understand that is I have not done any few study. All these are lab study that we, we do. So. Yeah, I know there was one other surfactant they looked at years ago, the Cygnet. Um, I think it's Select or Signet Plus. Um, and that was sent out to a lab and, it, uh, you know, I think it was quite a bit better in the LD50s on some of the salmons. And so that might be something to look at, too. And yeah, there's some I, data on that available. I did not look into that. But uh, what, I, what I, well, to add that to that is what I think that what Department of Boating Water Way is doing is a great thing that what they're trying to do is ask a question about is target organism is, is, is a factor. So we can use other fish species to do it, but 
I think the major thing that we want to answer the question about the delta is whether they have any effects on the uh, endangered species. I know salmon is one of them. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was one of them too, yeah. Uh, we do try to ask the other question about using other adjuvants because we, we found that this the, uh, agudex is quite toxic. Maybe uh, using another adjuvant to substitute the uh, uh, agudex might be uh, helpful to uh, make the uh, chemical less toxic. We, we're looking into the competitor uh, as one of the uh, adjuvants we're going to study. Yeah, and I know that Cygnet we've done, there, there is uh, lab data from that Cygnet adjuvant, so it might be good to look at that one too while okay. you're looking at them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's one more. I'll just yell. You don't have to walk all the way up here. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. We, we yeah. want to get you on the recording. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I want to hear you. You stop. Thanks for your presentation. Very interesting. Oh, thank you. I see that you've got 24D listed up there. Um, two questions. One is could you elaborate perhaps on what data you might have for it? And the second question is whether or not triclopyr, uh, another phenoxy acid herbicide, whether or not you have any plans at looking at how it behaves. No, we all depends on the uh, pump voting waterway, what they really want to look at. So we kind of really are busy with the herbicide, the new herbicide that they have. And we need to get a report back to them first so that they can start using those herbicide or eat when they can use a herbicide. But we haven't had any plan to look at any other herbicide yet. So, sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you. So I'm going to suggest we take a five minute break uh, and let the panel get itself organized and then we're still going to try to get everybody out at the promised hour. Um, and so don't take too long. But uh.